Hello everyone, welcome to the finals of Grand Prix Sacramento presented by Channel Fireball. I'm Matt Sperling, I'm joined in the booth by Pro Tour champion, number one ranked player, and Magic Hall of Famer, Ben Starks. Yeah, I got all this, I got, I wouldn't say all this, Tell I got most of the superlatives, one of the best limited players in the world. And we're getting to watch one of the best players in the world, Tom Martell, against Philip Yam, a very reputable, known local player, battling on his home turf and trying to secure his first Grand Prix win. Yeah. And they're studying each other's deck lists right now. So that only creates more gamesmanship. While maybe it's a little bit less pure magic because you kind of know what your opponent has. On the other hand, knowing what your opponent has. It kind of almost makes it more pure in a different way. It certainly allows more maneuvering, more of that cat and mouse game that you were talking about. Right, and, I, and, and I'll say it again. Uh, Tom Martell, a player who is going to gain clearly when he knows all the information, has time to think about things. Phil Yam, though, no slouch himself. He's a player that us, those of us who live in California have known for a lo quite a while. Phil Yam, not a player who is going to you know, lie down and go away just because you're a Tom Martel. Uh, he's he's going to show up ready. Phil Yam's deck has some really powerful cards. Mythic rares, regular rares, some of the best in the set. Regardless of who wins this match, I think it's fair to say Phil Yam probably has the best deck in this top eight. But I think with Tom's deck able to match up fairly well against Phil, Tom definitely could beat him. Yeah, and, Phil, and Phil's deck, I would say, better at the top end. Tom's deck may be better top to bottom. Is if you want to look at the, you know, on the, the average card in Tom's mm -hmm. deck, the median card might be stronger. And that, and that can play out in a number of ways because Phil maybe doesn't draw the, car, the, the bombs or mm -hmm. Tom's able to deal with one of them and, and Phil doesn't have time to deploy a second one. Sure. And if Phil draws some of those ineffective cards, such as the Boon or the Cavern Lamp Pad, and Tom is applying pressure, I mean, that's just not going to work. You know, those cards Absolutely. are not going to stop a white-black beatdown deck. So I believe by virtue of the fact that Phil entered as the higher seed, that will let him elect to play first or draw as he, de as he decides. So that'll be interesting to see. Uh, Normally, you kind of go into that firing blind with knowledge of the opponent's deck list. That's out, that's out the window. Mm -hmm. Now you can kind of see with complete information. Do I want to play or draw? I would be really surprised if Phil chose to draw because Phil, when you choose to draw, when you have a control deck against an aggressive deck, it's generally because you have cheap removal. Right. If you're a you know mono blackish control deck and you've got two cures and uh, some some early bounce and you know Return a lot of two drops is, yeah. yeah then you can draw because you're not looking to race them and you're going to be able to match your removal to their creatures so even though they're an aggressive deck you may still choose to draw against them but phil phil doesn't really have that phil has a, a few too many five and six mana spells to want to be on the draw exactly phil has these slow powerful cards so he needs to get them out a turn early not a turn late right so we expect to see phil bm on the play here there there you get a shot of phil uh Got to be feeling a little bit of pressure, as is Tom Martell. Even though Tom Martell's been here before and, you know, he's got his, his resume is already in place, this is still the highest, the highest stakes match yeah. of the weekend. This is what, Tom's third GP Finals appearance? The trophy's on the line. Uh, pro points are on the line. Those certainly meaningful for Tom. Yeah. As both a top 25 ranked player and a player trying to, you know, yeah. make platinum every year if he can. Yeah, I don't think he's having that strong a season yet so far this season. So now, I mean, with the points he has from the World Championships plus here, he's positioned to make a run. So the stage is set and the players are looking at their opening hands. Tom, you can see him fan out a hand with, I think, two planes in a swamp and four spells. Phil, not so lucky to have that kind of mix, is going to go right back to, for six cards. Yeah, and that's really what Phil doesn't want to see because Phil needs to make a lot of land drops to cast those slow, powerful, ex you know, expensive cards. Yep. So Phil's deck, not necessarily a deck that mulligans very well. Yeah, we've talked about that early in the tournament, but if you're just joining us, something that's key to think about when you're if you're if you're on the, if you're mulliganing with a control deck you might need to have six lands an expensive spell and some stuff to do early mm -hmm. to make it every card that you give up makes it less and less right. likely that that's going to happen right tom's deck is a deck that would mulligan a lot better because he only needs to have two or three lands to oh, cast his two and three drops and you can make you can make three lands and two threats with only five cards right you can't make six lands you know Two answers, two late game cards. You know, like right. I said, it's just a little bit harder with the control deck. That's the position Phil finds himself in. He's got the powerful cards to pull himself out of it, but he's going to have to be at the mercy of the deck here. Right, right. As long as the top of his deck cooperates with what he has in hand, then he can still piece it all together. It just becomes harder and harder to do as you go down in cards. All right, so let's see if we can get a look at, at Phil's six. 
right away we see two swamps, uh, three swamps. He's improved his prospects certainly, but his hand is swamps and blue cards. Yeah, and not even the best blue cards. Griptide is okay against Tom, it's not the best. And the, uh, what is it, Breaching Hippocamp, something like that? Yeah, uh, not a card that, not a card you want in your opening hand, regardless of the mana. With no blue, it's yeah. even worse. A card I don't know the name of, mostly because I never play. Okay, so the bad, <laughs> the bad news for Phil, no island yet. The good news, no permanence for Tom except two planes. Phil's first to the board with a creature. The Harpy comes down, sending both players to 19. Tom draws a fourth land... Goes opts for Wing Seed Rider instead of Read the Bones. And, that, and that's generally how things progress. Pretty standard. You want to put your creatures out. You can use your card drawing later once right. you run out of things to do. There's no urgency. You'd rather just no. develop a board. Phil Yam swings in for two, dropping Tom Martell to 17 life. Phil doesn't have an island, though. And if he doesn't find one really quickly, this game is going to get out of control wow. fast. Uh, Boon of... Uh, I'm sorry. Ordeal of Erebos. In fact, I would... I would say that Phil needs an island right now because he has grip tied. There it is. The island needed, he finds it. So he hits his fourth land drop. It's an island. Grip tide is now online. So even though Tom had quite an advantage with Wingseed Rider, all it ends up being is four damage to the face. It, do it doesn't end up staying on play. That's a huge draw step. Huge draw. Island. This game could go either way again. If that card is virtually any card but island, this game would have been effectively over. That Wingseed Rider is hitting for five. Phil's discarding two cards, and he already took a mulligan, and Tom's deploying more things. Yep, Tom doesn't have a land drop, so he's not able to do anything but redeploy the Wingseed Rider, right. this time only in two turns. Right. Form. And this game is close to reset now. Phil, an interesting uh, decision. He's got two cards. He's only got one island, and all his spells are blue for the most part, so he can only do one thing. He's going to say go. The Hippocamp has flash, so he'll be looking to cast that at some point this turn. Right. Tom Martell starts things off, attacking with both creatures. Representing four damage, the life totals here tied at 13, so Phil might be thinking about blocking, might, think, might be thinking about getting in some attack. What do you think about this? Um, I'm thinking if I'm Phil, I'm going to block because he's got um, Precent kind of Chimera in his hand, and I think maybe even two of them, plus the more powerful late game deck to begin with. So I don't really care about this Harpy, and I'm, not, and I'm trying to prolong this game so that I can find an island and start deploying my 3-4 flyers. So uh, I think if I'm Phil, I go ahead and drop the... Um, the Hippocamp and untap the Harpy and just make at least one block. So Phil Yam has Triton Tactics in his hand. I think what he's doing here is playing, he, he, Triton Tactics will allow him to block next turn with more toughness to do it with. So True. perhaps this time he's going to attack for five. Now of course the Scholar had come out, that kind of halts his ground attack. He'll still have defenses up with Triton Tactics, so it looks like that's what he's setting up. He hasn't drawn a fifth land and that's important. Right, it is a good point that he has Triton Tactics, and he has done a good job of not really broadcasting it and of maybe putting himself in a position to get more value out of it. The thing is, if Tom has no tricks, then his attack last turn, uh, his block last turn would have been effective enough. And if Tom does have tricks, they're probably going to trump this tactics, I feel like. Um, now, if Tom doesn't have any tricks, he could get blown out here pretty bad. Yeah, we see he, he happens to have, you know, the battle-wise Valor, so uh, he's a Scourge Mark also in his hand. With Phil Yan with four mana, maybe Tom will hesitate to just drop the Scourge Mark out, but it looks like he's going to go for it. Well, he knows his list, so he knows whether Phil even has a second Grip Tide or not. Right, a second Grip Tide or something like a Farika's Cure it just doesn't seem to be on the list, so Tom goes ahead and makes a 4-3 flyer, draws a card. Tom's still a little bit bottlenecked on mana, but able to cast the trick that's yeah. in his hand. Yeah, and Tom, and very importantly. Tom, a very thoughtful player. He's going to put Phil on Triton Tactics here because that's the only way Phil's attack makes sense and the way this game makes sense. He, I don't even think he'll send the Philosopher, and if he does, it'll be just because he doesn't care about it at all. And you're right. He's only going to send his 4-3 Wing Seed Rider. Uh, Phil Yam, he has Triton Tactics, but what's the... Uh, okay... It's, does Tom it's even a, it's need a to trade. do anything? It's a three toughness, though, so... Yeah, it doesn't really do anything, except it won't on tap next turn. So that was kind of, what, an elaborate chump block? Or does it... Huh. 
Well, it won't untap next turn either, yeah. right? So, you, so I guess Phil's buying time. At nine, at nine life, uh, Phil's gonna try to buy some time, and now he's drawn the second island, so some Chimera joining the fray. So what looks like a kind of confusing play turns out to be actually pretty helpful. Yeah, well, I don't necessarily like the exact uh, set of plays that led up to that, but once there, he does need to make that play and lock it down, right. so that he has a chance to drop his two uh, Chimeras and be in a position you know, of sort of stability. Phil Yam at nine life, he can still survive, you know, a hit, uh, not two because of the scholar, but he can, you know, so he's got some time, he'll be able to develop his board a bit, nothing else besides the wing seed rider from Tom is very threatening. Right, I mean, we know that Tom is holding the battle wise Valor so that Phil's uh, defense of a second Chimera isn't going to work, but in the event that Tom was not holding that, then uh, this defense, he wouldn't even have to take another hit. The, the two Chimeras would be able to effectively double block the Wingsteed Rider. So, Phil Yam, it's, this is interesting. I, I believe he has Boon of Erebos in his hand. If he attacks with the, with the, the Chimera next turn, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but he might be presenting a two-turn clock or a two-turn attack, uh, and he might be thinking about how he can maybe counterpunch here with Tom only at 11 life. Yeah. And, I mean, if Tom doesn't draw another trick... Phil's plan does leave him, you know, it does leave him okay. As long as he makes the double block and doesn't, you know, just block, I think that he's not completely out of it. He could, he could take out the Wingsteed Rider. Okay, Phil being attacked by both traveling philosophers. Now, this represents a trick because, of course, the 3-4 uh, Chimera would otherwise be eating a traveling philosopher. One of, importantly, one of the tricks on Tom's deck list is plus two, plus two to two creatures, Dauntless Onslaught. Phil Yam says, if you've got that, show it to me, basically. Oh, yeah. yeah, you can ignore that at this point. You're not beating that. Can you beat just Battlewise Valor? I'm not so sure. But Phil's going to try it. Uh, he is at least trading off one of the Philosophers. Unfortunately, he's not going to be left with anything on the board except five mana. Yeah, and he's not taking any damage, so he'll be at nine. Assuming he has to drop another Chimera. Now, now the Chimera can trade up. Can trade with the wing seed rider, yeah. unless Tom finds something else. Yeah. You know, Tom with read the bones in hand. If he if he doesn't end up with a trick on his turn next turn, he can try to find one. Uh, Phil not left with. He might have drawn a grip tie, but what choice does he have? Or no, sorry, he drew Thassa. Yeah, well, Thassa that's not going to help him here. Normal. I mean, normally Thassa is a fantastic card in, in draft. Uh, and it constructed here when you're this far behind it's just not a card that does anything no i mean phil really in a bad position no matter what he chose it was it was more apparent to us that this wasn't going to work because we knew he had the battle wise valor but you know phil doesn't get to see his hand just his deck list and, and I, act I actually give phil a lot of credit for that block the reason is you can see from what happened there was no way for phil to get an advantage if tom had a trick like that mm -hmm. so what choice does he really have but to but to block and try to progress the game right yeah, maybe. I mean, if he takes the additional two and doesn't block with the Chimera... But then this turn doesn't look much better. Well, he can, play the, he can play the Chimera, right? And then if he, he wants to double block the Wingsteed Rider, he can, right? It will just turn into a 7-6 if, if it's Battlewise Valor. Yeah, but then at that point you've taken two or four damage and maybe, maybe the Valor just kills you. So you're at 7... The Valor does kill you on the favorite hoplite. It is, it is seven, right? Ooh, yes. Uh, and, if, and if it doesn't, it's very close. So, right. the, so, so, that, so the Scholar will kill so you. That, anyway. Yeah, so the Scholar will kill you. So that's what I mean by recognizing I probably can't beat that card, so I'm not going to play around it. I'm going to block. And rather than, uh, rather than lose whether you have it or not, I'll only lose if you do have it. Right. Just as we saw in the last round, Eric had to do at a point in the game. He tried to play around it, but once he realized he couldn't, he said, all right, I'll block with all my guys. And Tom has continuously had it, and that's why he's in this finals and about to go up a game. Right, a, a, a well-played game one, but one that Tom Martell has taken control of. Tom was thinking about the best way to tighten the screws here mm -hmm. and uh, keep applying pressure. Certainly, we're going to see uh, the 4-3 flyer come in. What else is going to be turned sideways? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if Tom wants to attack with anything else, and that, that's what he's considering. All right, there you see Wingseed Rider, 4-3, knocking Phil Yam down to a very delicate five life. Uh, delicate not only because he's dealing with a flyer, but because that's, that scholar is sitting there. Uh, so the, the paths that Phil Yam has to victory are slowly getting cut off. 
Yeah, and Tom realized that like he can't really bluff anything at this point, even though he has a lot of tricks, because Phil's not in a position to be playing around anything. Right. So an attack without with anything but the wing speed route would have been fruitless, as the charlatan would have just blocked the philosopher. Yeah. The shipwreck singer would have blocked the hoplite. Blocks that you wouldn't necessarily make on turn three if you're at twenty. <laughs> that Phil's forced to make it on this board at this time. So Phil. Dropping a Chimera is at least representing a trade with the Wingseed Rider. His other blocks available to him, uh, not great. Tom draws a six land. That's actually kind of important because Scholar can now drain for two life a turn and maybe the lethal two life this turn. Tom adding up the attack. If I, Tom thinking if I attack with everything, what's the best Phil can do? It looks right. like the best Phil can do is going to be to block let through the two one power creatures uh not really have a great block well he doesn't his blocks aren't that bad i mean he can throw the shipwreck singer on the giant wingsteed rider the chimera on the laguna band elder and the charlatan on the philosopher so he'll lose only the shipwreck singer and tom will lose the two creatures but tom doesn't really care about those two creatures and that that, that would drop phil to one and leave wingsteed rider in place so right. yeah it, it actually, it doesn't turn out so bad for Right, Phil. it drops Phil to three immediately with the ability for Tom to drain him twice. And uh, it would force Tom, Phil to draw an answer to the Scholar. Yeah, so we'll see how we'll see how the attacks and the blocks proceed. However it pans out, Phil Yam will be really up against the ropes here. Yeah. And, you know, I like that play because, you know, Tom really doesn't care about those creatures. And there's no way that Phil can kill the creature like he does care about, the Scholar. Yeah. If Phil wants to trade the Chimera for the Wingsteed Rider, then that's not a big deal. And if, if Phil makes the blocks I said, which are the, the most obvious blocks on board that are good for him because it's two creatures that Tom loses, only one that he loses, yeah. then Tom loses creatures that Tom doesn't really care about at this point in the game. So, Andrew, so if you're thinking about how do I process a complex board like this at home, the first thing that perhaps Phil realizes is that since I'm at five and you have a scholar, I can only take two damage. That means right. that the two creatures that I don't block have to be... Scholar and Hoplite. Right. The only thing to figure out is which of the three creatures I have to block. Am I going to block with which of my creatures? Phil finds the block that you suggested where he wipes out two of Tom's ground creatures, sacrificing his ship's for singer, and taking two damage going to three. Right, and with the Chimera's ability to trade with the Rider and the Charlatan's ability to stop the Hoplite, if Phil does top deck an answer to Scholar here, he is alive in this game. I don't know if he has any. I, I don't know how many he has. I and mean, that's it. We're going to see yeah. game one. Goes to Tom Martell on the back of a wing steed rider and a few, uh, you know, key pump spells in combat. And that was an exciting game. So what do you think? Okay, let's think back over those early turns. Phil was in a rough position. He didn't get much value out of the Triton tactics. He got some time out of it. Right. Do you think that... Maybe there's a sequence that would have worked out better, or was that really maybe the best he could do, tapping it down for the two turns and being able to, you know, mount his defense? You know, uh, it depends quite a bit. It's hard to say how things would have played out. Yeah. The fact that he never drew another land to, like, he never drew an island to let him play a Chimera and have Triton tactics up. Right. That leads me to believe he wouldn't have found a better spot for right. Triton tactics. Because I know... I know what I wanted to do, which is not necessarily better. And, you know, when you're in the booth not playing the game, it's harder to really be, like, super in focused. Like, we're here paying attention. We, we, we care we're analyzing everything. But, you know, you have a plan because you've played matches with your deck. You know your deck. You know your cards. You know your opponent's deck list. You're sitting there studying it. Right. So, you know, I, I feel like, you know, you're going to probably play better than someone analyzing it. But me, I would have probably played the 3-2, uh, on tap the Harpy, and then just block both Tom's creatures that turn. Then the not played the uh, not not taking the damage on tap my guys and then Triton tactics the following turn. Sure. If you do that, Tom's gonna use the battle uh, wise Valor to make his Wingsuit Rider into a five five for the moment three three afterwards and uh, take out the Harpy. And um, the end result there is like you don't get to Triton tactics the Wingsuit Rider. Right. You instead have to rely on those two Chimeras. At the time, at the time, Phil didn't have a fifth land. I don't think. Right. Uh, so what he decided to do. Well, the turn he didn't he didn't block with the hippocamp. He decided to actually play a little bit more aggressively, and then try to use Triton tactics as a kind of a trump card. Right. Uh, Tom was able to play after that combat a, a scholar. The scholar being really an all star card for Tom in, yeah. in all the matches we've seen so and far. And it's been that way all day. We saw Luis had two of them in his white black control deck in the first draft today, and it was an all star for him there too. Yeah. So that's a card. Just having done some coverage this weekend, that's a card that's moved up in my. Uh, 
valuation, you know, in the back of my mind, next time I fire up a, a Theros draft. But yeah, that was going to be a really, really tough game for Phil to win. I don't believe that there's any sequence of plays that would have left Phil a favorite in that game. I'm just wondering if there's even a sequence of plays that would have left him in a slightly less uh, desperate position at the end. Yeah. I think uh, he, he definitely showed up with a game plan, and the, the, the choices he made uh, are very, very, very reasonable. Uh, very reasonable, exactly. Yeah. And he had a reason in that hippocamp trading with a 2 2 wouldn't be great. Right. Uh, he didn't know the scholar was about to come down. So that's, that's an example of the kind of thing, you know, as, as he's thinking through what to do. Right. And he figured maybe if Tom doesn't have anything, I'll get to eat this Wingsteed Rider with my Harpy. And if he does have something, then uh, he's just going to use it to eat my Harpy now if I go ahead and uh, block the Wingsteed Rider with the Harpy. Exactly. So now, if you're just joining us, you can see Philip Yam right now on camera. He's in, I believe, his first Grand Prix final against Tom Martell, who's been here before and won a Grand Prix before and is now up a game. GP and D champion, um, GP Columbus finalist, I believe. And uh, Tom Martell leaning on both his experience and a deck that's actually pretty good. A very good deck. Very good deck. Maybe not as powerful as Phil's deck, but definitely has the aggression to punish Phil's deck if it stumbles at all like it did in that game. Yeah. And uh, we actually mentioned specifically before they started that cards like Hippocamp are uh, not the best tools to stay alive in casting no, bombs. No, just not effective at stopping early beatdown to get to your bombs. Better than nothing but not the strong defensive cards you're looking yeah. for. Yeah, and even, even Prescient Chimera, not the best complement to these five and six mana bombs because it is it is just just another five mana spell. Right. If uh, Phil could pull some cards from Tom's last opponent and take a couple of those coastline Chimeras, those would be excellent. Phil could throw those out in their major roadblocks and then maybe unload his rares. Yeah, and you and you know what? You wonder, you wonder if thinking back to the draft, Phil took the normally more powerful prescient chimera over any coastline chimera i mean there, there was three of them at least mm -hmm. in eric uh pay's deck so yeah and, and it's unfortunate that we don't have a full draft viewer because i'm now wondering at what, at what point phil saw those coastline chimeras because if it's pick three of the draft pick six of the draft you're not going to take a coastline chimera over a precinct chimera. absolutely absolutely if it's pack, pack two pack three and you've already got several rares that are expensive and a really powerful deck you should take the coastline chimera right and that's the kind of thing that's it takes it takes a a really expert player to see that while the cards are being drafted. Now that we've watched matches play, you know, games and matches play out, we can say, oh, well, it's obvious that he would rather have a four mana spell than a five mana spell. But, you know, this, drafting is drafting is very challenging, and to be mindful of all the cards you've drafted, your curve, your game plan. Uh, all that being said, Phil's drafted a very powerful deck. He'll be on the play for game two, yeah, down a game. And we don't even know when he saw those or uh, what what uh, what picks. He got his rares, right. so well, we, we can't whether criticize. Was, whether there was chimeras in, in that pack in particular, we of course. don't know. Tom, we had a chance to uh, view his draft. Luis Scott Vargas and Ben Stark, who is in the booth with me now, mm -hmm. Matt Sperling. But Luis Scott Vargas was on earlier to analyze Tom Martell's draft. And I think you and you and Luis were pretty pleased with how Tom drafted in terms of the skill level on display. Right, because while Tom didn't have to really uh, waffle between colors very much, Tom did have to draft a deck that you don't draft that commonly, a black-white heroic. And he was taking all the right cards at the right times here, to really meld it together. Here we see both players have kept their hands, and Phil has looks like a very powerful hand. Three mana, Thassa. Uh, I, I caught a few other cards, now they escape me. Uh, he's, not, he's got five lands, and his deck certainly is mana hungry. Looks I, like a charlatan is that in the back. Yeah, and a cavern lamp pad. Wow, so Traveling Philosopher 2-2 doesn't match up well against this 2-3 that that's about to come out. So Phil... Early defense, Thassa to make his end game really, really powerful. Tom with Plains, Plains Swamp, the mana, the mana base he wants to start yeah, out and, with. Yeah, and so Tom has an interesting turn here. He can lay the ordeal right now and get to attack, but you know then he's exposing his trick right away. Here we see it. The ordeal of Erebus comes down. Traveling Philosopher becomes a three-three. Phil Yam goes to 17, and Tom has another creature. And that's what I was going to say. I saw the favorite Hoplite, which makes that play a little less automatic because you get more value if you put the ordeal on the Hoplite. But then again, you do, you also there's a benefit to doing the ordeal now rather than later. As soon as it gets the three counters, Phil has to discard two cards, and the 5-5 five, five 
philosopher gets to stay there. Right, and the traveling philosopher was going to be a pretty useless creature, and now it's powered up and in the game. So weighing the benefit of getting the extra plus one plus one like quicker on the uh, hoplite, you don't actually get an extra one long because they both trigger at three, but you want that ordeal to trigger while Phil still has cards in hand, and you want to uh, put it on the hoplite. And, and I would say you. I mean, it's, it's a little bit helpful to cast it while the opponent's tapped out because at least you know at least he got that three damage in. Right. And he's made the he's made the traveling philosopher into an attractive target for removal or balance as opposed to an irrelevant creature. Right. So like in the event that Tom has more pump, Phil's under enormous pressure now. In the event that Tom doesn't have anything else, I don't know if that um, philosopher philosopher is going to be able to attack two more times to trigger the ordeal. So Phil Yam choosing to add Thassa to the board instead of Triton Fortune Hunter. He wants to get the scry ability online quickly. Uh, he lo and Triton Fortune Hunter, not a great blocker. So Yeah, so, so Phil not um, trying to force Tom to have another trick, which is what I was afraid of by putting it on the philosopher, because let's say he had played the 2-2 two -two and Tom doesn't have a pump spell. Tom can't attack and get a second counter to get a third. Let's say he had put it on the Hoplite. Since the Hoplite has that ability where the damage is prevented to it, it would pick up its second counter as attack and guaranteed be able to get its third counter on the following turn and trigger off. Right. That's why I was saying I'm not sure that I like Tom putting the ordeal on the Philosopher, but it's a close play by, by all means. There's, there's lots of upside to doing it, and uh, Tom, didn't, Tom didn't get punished for doing it at all because Phil did not lay a second 2-2 to put himself in a position to be able to double block it. There we see the Gun of Ban Elder. So that's going to give Tom three life, and the Traveling Philosopher moving up to 4-4, four, four, Phil Yam down to 13 life already. So those, those ordeals, don't waste, they don't waste much time at all in knocking the opponent down and building a giant creature. Right. Phil scrying to the bottom, looking for you know, answers to that, to that quickly huge creature. Phil trying to find Griptide, Prognastic Sphinx, Keepsake Gorgon. If he has a second Swamp, I don't know if he does or doesn't. I don't believe he does, but he's definitely so he's put a, put a die on his deck to just to remember to scry with Thassa. Uh, Cavern Lampad. Short, now Triton Fortune. If he had played that instead of Thassa, that might be an attractive uh, Lampad target this turn. Right. Uh, well, I think he's one turn away from that. But uh, if he had played that. You know, okay, so there we go. He makes the two creatures this turn, and you're right. He's, this is the turn he has five mana, so he's still set up to set up to uh, bestow next turn if, if he wants to. The problem now is that the, that ordeal is going to go off. That ordeal is about to go off. Discard two cards, and that's it. Phil Yam has exactly two cards. The good news for Phil Yam is that his best cards are still in his library, and Thassa is going to let him scry every turn. Right. So he's going to have a couple of shots to find Prognostic Sphinx. Or uh, Keepsake Gorgon, but he needs a Swamp for that as well. Right, the fact that he needs another land to play either Keepsake Gorgon or Shipbreaker Kraken is pretty important. Another Lagana Ban Elder. Yeah, and Tom's just gaining three pre-combat before that ordeal hits the graveyard. And I'm pretty sure Tom is going to send uh, the Le Leona Band Elder and the uh, Traveled Philosopher because he wants any trade he can get to try and clear um, Thassa from coming online. All right, so Phil Yam going down to zero cards thanks to that ordeal of Erebos. Traveling Philosopher, really the ordeal of Erebos showing its, its power here. Yeah. Traveling Philosopher, a 5-5, five, five, and Phil Yam with nothing but whatever's on the top of the deck. Yeah, it's easier for us looking at Tom's hand knowing he doesn't have that pump spell, but I really, I really question just letting that Philosopher grow to a 5-5 five, five and that ordeal go off, because is Phil really in a position where he can beat a pump spell this game anyway? Ooh. The first scry reveals a 5-5, five, five. so if, if Phil needs a big thing to come back, that's a great way to start, something that trades with the Traveling Philosopher. That was the perfect card to get Phil right back in this game. It's going to activate the Thassa, and it's a 5-5. Five, five. Wow, it turns on Thassa as well. That is huge. You can see that Tom doesn't have much going on besides that 5-5. Five, five. No, I think that was the perfect draw, and now Phil's back in this game. And you know what? Phil's deck having a couple... Prescient Chimera, he knows he has actually several cards that would turn on that Thassa. Wow, another another huge turn here. Tom has drawn a combat trick. So Dauntless Onslaught joins his hand. Uh, that throws another range. Of course, it's hard to use combat tricks past indestructible creatures. Right, with Thassa being indestructible, what kind of an attack are we looking at from Tom here? What, is, what does he have going? Yeah, I think... If Tom plays this scholar, it's because Thassa is indestructible. You can't really set up set something up against it. Nope. All right, Phil looking at a unicorn. That's certainly going to go to the no, bottom. No, need something better than that. I think that was the keepsake Gorgon. 
uh, was either a keepsake organ or a sip of hemlock. Either way, he's a swamp away. So he'll wait, but he'll get the scry to try to find it. Um, Phil Yam doesn't look like he has an attack, except remember, Thassa not only scries, it not only is a 5 of indestructible, it also gives unblockable. Right, and he's in a position where he can poke with one of the small guys. That's what you're going to see. The islands tap left, the hunter traps right, comes in for 2 damage, unblockable. And look at Tom's hand. He's got Sip of Hemlock, so if he draws a swamp, he can kill Sealock Monster, turning off Thassa and effectively ending this game. Wow. So... Every, if, if a swamp can come, everything could change. He like Phil could go from two five five to zero r immediately. Yeah, and that might be the game. Yeah, but if Phil's able to find those precinct chimeras before Tom finds that swamp, Tom can't sip the fast away because it's indestructible. Okay, so a six land and a second black source, but to come into play tap land. <laughs> Ooh, this is a tough decision. <laughs> this is interesting. I'd be inclined to throw it on the bottom. But yeah, we'll see me how too. Phil think, what Phil thinks about it. Phil agrees. He goes tends it to the bottom and takes a random card. Now, was that a swamp or a baleful Eidolon? It's an, actually an island. That's what he didn't want to see. Island, that's a, that's that's not going to help him. It gets no. him a little bit closer to Monstrous. That's what he really didn't want to see, because if that was a double blue card, like a Precinct Chimera, that would help solidify you know his position. And if that was a swamp, he could cast Keepsake Gorgon. Yeah, so island kind of, you know, the nightmare draw step for Phil Yam. But Tom Martell is going to need something still to break through. Two more damage. From Triton Force Hunter, uh, Tom Martell going down to 22. Plenty of time. Will Tom draw the swamp? Ooh. So just just as Phil drew a fifth island, Tom draws a fifth plains. Well, keeping things fair. Now we expect Phil to, with with, with scrying every turn, you know. Yeah. We expect Phil to kind of emerge from this a little bit, a little bit easier than than Tom does. Yeah, but Tom has the flyer. Tom has the flyer. Tom has the Scholar, so... I mean, if Tom made an Alpha here, played the Plains and made an Alpha, if Phil didn't have anything, I think Phil might be dead. Now, I don't know if Tom will do that. Because Tom has the Dauntless Unthrive's hand still, so you're absolutely right. He, can, he would be able to drain from one with Scholar, give plus four, plus four to two of the creatures that weren't blocked. Yeah. That would certainly be lethal damage. Yeah, and I, I think Tom sees it. I think Tom's just trying to think about the number of cards that could be that would mess him up, because... If that was, say, Phil's Griptide, mm -hmm. Tom would run face first into that Griptide and pro probably lose a game that might be unlosable. He might have nothing left after the Griptide resolved if, if Phil did have Griptide. All right, so Tom, here's what he's done instead. He made the he's safe play. He's attacked with only the Wingsteed Rider. He's given it plus two, plus two with Dauntless Onslaught. The Hoplite is going to gain plus, plus one counter in the process, but it, it chose not to attack. So yeah. five damage gets through. Dropping Phil to three, yeah, I and not just at three, but three against an active Scholar. I like this play a lot, because one, you find out he doesn't have the Griptide. And now, if Phil doesn't play anything, you can play around Griptide again, but if he plays something, you can Alpha, because you know he doesn't have the Griptide previous. Phil scries, he sees Swamp, but he knows Swamp is not enough, because Tom's kill is on board. Right, I like this play a lot by Tom. I think it's very sound. I think that... If Phil taps his mana to play something, you're gonna be able to drain in a turn, drain on your turn. And there it is. Tom Martell is your Grand Prix Sacramento 2014 champion.